What's up, filmmakers? Den here, and today we are going to go deep into creating content. Now, creating content across social media platforms so that you can become an absolute authority in your field so that people want to listen to you, want to follow you, so that you will build an audience that will then reach out to you and say, how can we do more work together? My guest today is Stephen G. Pope. Stephen is an engineer who's turned TikTok sensation and is helping content creators build content machines with a very sleek team. And this part interview is going to be in two parts. So the first part, we're going to talk specifically about content creation, how to create content, where to get the ideas from. I think you're going to find this really beneficial. And then we've got another episode coming later on. It's going to talk about how do you make the machine work. Stephen, great to uh, have a chance to, to chat to you. Um, yeah. As I said in the intro, we met a few weeks ago at Sam Ovens Mastermind. And, and got sat together and started talking about content. And that's an area where um, you are really gunning. Um, tell me, for, for people who perhaps don't know you, how did you find yourself in this content world and, and what, what got you excited about it? Yeah, so the short version is I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I grew another business in the technology space. I was a software developer, grew that to a couple million dollars a year. I was on Inc. Magazine's fastest growing companies. And I sold that company and um, I kind of had forgotten how hard it was to start another, uh, how to start a company. And I started to, to go into the next one. I was like, how am I going to do this? I started researching how people were doing it. I knew number one video had to be a centerpiece of it. I did start to get introduced with people like Gary Vee and stuff like that. And I, I was, I've always been the kind of person that can connect the dots. I was like, I, I trust that guy. He doesn't seem like a scammer to me. And I see a few people, they're talking about how content is this. I didn't know how it would work. So I just jumped in. I started creating content on LinkedIn, started creating videos for a, a different business that I don't actually, that I'm not running right now. Um, I started doing all that stuff and I just started to kind of fall in love with marketing, video content, realizing, man, I could have built my other business so much faster. I knew I had to build this next business a lot faster. I had kids. I couldn't let it evolve the way I did. And so ultimately, I just started to develop new products around marketing and video. And of course, in the beginning, they were somewhat generic because my understanding was more generic. And then over time, I just started creating a lot of videos running into all the pain points because I'll tell you, getting into content is hard. There's a, it's, there's a lot of little things to it. There's like making good content and then organizing it and distributing it and all these different things. And then through that process, I started applying all my engineering skills, my frameworks, my systems, technology automation to solve all the problems I was having. Started creating videos on those. People were really excited and then used the content to develop new products essentially, which I think is people always, people's understanding of content's too short, sh short sighted, which I understand. It's like, how many clients or how many videos until I get a client? And, um, but in reality, there's all these really interesting things that come from cl uh, creating content. Like, yeah, you get clients, but also you develop new products. You, people start posting your videos into Facebook groups and people start reaching out to you in all sorts of weird ways. Um, so that's really like the, the, the backstory of how I ended up in this spot where I help people create really good video. And then I also help them create all the systems to distribute it. I, I remember back in about 20, maybe 2016, 2017, uh, and Gary V was doing Daily V, and, and his whole mantra was just document your life. And he had D Rock following him around, and he was going in and out of meetings. And it was, it was. I remember working with a with a, a mentor at the time who said, you know, um, Gary had said to him, you, you, you've got to get into your content game. And so I started making content as well, and we did daily videos they were like tips videos and we did like a hundred tips videos for a hundred days and then we put them out again for another hundred days and then i started making these like three or four minute um web series i called them be real b dash real so a bit of a reference to filmmaking um and and we put a lot of work into them and i remember at the time thinking god this is just like 
such a lot of work and you could never really tell if right. it was valuable. But I remember, I remember distinctly a client of mine, he became a client for a couple of years saying, when I, when I, I'd been on your email list, but when I saw your Be Real videos, I got to see who you really were. And then when we had a conversation, I felt like I already knew you. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. and I think at the time, I became overwhelmed by the, the, not having a system for producing it really well. And then I ran right. out of ideas. I, I ran out of ideas of what to post about. Yeah, And sure. I think a lot of people, you know, sort of four or five years on, I'm, I'm starting to move back into content. Um, but what, what advice would you give to someone who is, you know, our audience are largely filmmakers. They're, they're used to making content for other people, but they often struggle with putting themselves out there. And I guess as a software developer and engineer, you weren't naturally someone who wanted to get on camera necessarily. No, but I, was yet afraid. I was afraid. I was terrified to get on camera. Like before I did it, I was, I didn't sleep for like two weeks. But I, the only reason why, the only way I did it is I was just committed to doing it. So I, um, I love the analogy of um, you know, elite athletes. No elite athlete wants to get up at three in the morning and train for eight hours a day. Yeah. But they do it anyway because they know the result is what they need to get. And I think it's, a very, it's the same thing with entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Number one, you have to believe, right? So you have to believe this is going to work. You have to just look around at how the world's working. Like, why are all these people doing this? Like, you know what I mean? Like some of them are out there doing it and it's not working for them, but, um, a lot of people it is. And for those that it's not, it's just because they probably haven't been doing it long enough. They're not making the right kind of content. So you got to believe you got to commit. And then if you do those two things, the whole process is just going to move faster for you. Cause if you don't believe, you're going to go slower because you're like, you know, like what, like people are going to say, what's the ROI? It's like, you know, uh, so those things are like, if I could go back, I would tell myself to just do it faster. Cause like it's working really well now. And it, if I had just known that I would have just done it faster, but yeah. you know, that's hard for people to make that leap, but it, it just, what I'm saying is the truth. Just believe, commit and do it as fast as you can because it takes a while to get good at it. And, um, it takes a while before someone looks at your video, unless you're just a total natural and being like, wow, that's an awesome video, man. Like if, if that's not a natural ability, uh, ability for you, that's not going to just happen overnight. It's going to take some, some practice. Um, I think we, we have a, we live in a society where we, we are all primed for instant gratification. Right. And yeah. so I think we often um, have an unrealistic expectation of, what's going to work and how quickly it's going to work. And I think what happens certainly in the filmmaking world is um, there's, a, there's a natural skepticism and a reluctance to put themselves perhaps out on camera. Um, and I think the other thing that, that, that people struggle with is like knowing what to post. Um, and there was, there was a comment made at the event we were both at and there was a panel of YouTubers. And one of the, the core themes that came out of that discussion was stop making selfish content. And by selfish content, they, they were referring to content that you feel like you want to share with the world, but may not actually be valuable or relevant to your audience. So how do you, how do you come up with content ideas and how do you recommend someone who's completely green starting out begins with that first piece of content? Yeah, it is a little bit of a catch 22 because to learn what people actually care about, you have to produce something. So like, I believe, I, I believe that. But at the same time, if you only produce what's valuable to other people, then you might not be super interested in it. Probably the easiest way is like, I think a lot of the times people start creating stuff around problems they solve for themselves in a previous existence or life or whatever. And if, if it's truly not that, then you look at something that you help somebody else do, like one of your existing clients, like you ultimately just have to look at like, what's the transformation, even if it's a, 60 second video what is the transformation that you can help provide someone uh, in a short amount of time and just just looking at like either an existing client or in the past like what is the transformation and i think that's actually kind of the interesting thing is that what makes content valuable isn't always the how-to information it's actually defining what the gap actually is so you got to relate to what they want what the problem is make sure that they trust you. And then it's about like articulating what is the gap that you're going to close. Right. Um, and then 
so I think that's the the way to do it. Is like look look three or four years ago where you were. What advice did you need then, or what advice do your clients need? Articulate what the gap is, and then people will accept your how-to information. Because if you don't interesting, if you don't do those first things first, like if I just give you how-to information, but I haven't articulated number one that you even want this, or that you should trust me, or what I'm about to, or what ultimate bridge I'm about to provide to you, then all that how-to information, I'm really ultimately going to ignore it because I haven't, my brain hasn't really accepted that I even want it yet. It's, it's that old adage, isn't it? What's in it for me? You know, we have to, we have to sell the reason to watch the video in the first yeah. five to 10 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. And then with TikTok, they're making it even more crazy. So I have, I, when I work with clients, I have this script and it like, it puts things in order. So you say it in the right order. And then once clients get good at that, you know, they're usually that their opener is usually like 30 seconds. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, now how do you do that whole opener in like one sentence? Yeah. And like just cut out all that, the, all the, that useless stuff that you put in there and just get straight to the heart of it in like the first second or first couple seconds. Uh, and there's a little yeah. bit of an art to it, but, um, it's hard. It's it hard. Is, it's yeah, hard yeah. to edit down. Any of us with enough time can be very verbose and try and explain a concept. Explaining it in a sentence is something that I think a lot of people really struggle with. But you know how you can make it a little easier is to not try to solve their entire problem, like all their problems. Like, it, like that's what happens with most people. They go to create this video and it's like, it might as well be an essay. Yeah. So like, you know, just, just show them how to use the mic. How do you plug it in? Yeah. Like, that's all you need. Like compare two mics, not 20 mics, you know, just simplify the video. And now the message is more simple and probably more digestible and probably more likely to actually be watched. But like, people are like, you know, when they, and like when they're saying, like when they're trying to hit the pain points, they do 10 pain points. Well, it's just like, just yeah. do one and then make 10 videos on 10 different pain points. So like, because then people will naturally watch the first one and want to see the second one and the third one and so on. And therefore you get engagement. And with that engagement, you get someone saying, I, I'm now going to lock into this person because I trust them. What else have they got? Yeah. People care so much. Exactly. I mean, people care so much about helping people and wanting to come across well that they actually muddle their own message because they make the they make the valuable, like they, they, they feel like that has to be like too, like it, they have to explain everything that they know in one video, as opposed to one little tiny thing in across a hundred videos. Yeah. 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 Nice. It's interesting as well. I I've been, um, since, since the event, I've been actively posting daily content on, on LinkedIn and, um, a couple of really interesting things have happened is, and um, we've been connecting with people on LinkedIn and posting content and actively commenting and engaging on others' posts. Yeah. And in the space of a week, I've got uh, a woman who's booked in to do a podcast who has a platform that helps filmmakers, which will be oh, a great cool. story, um, but also a great opportunity for me to be exposed to her audience right, by yeah. providing her a platform. Um, I've had a number of quite meaningful conversations with people who were complete strangers a week ago, engaging in conversations about them and their business. And then they're asking me, tell me more about what you do. Right. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's, it, it's, it's effort for sure. But I was explaining to some clients this morning on one of my uh, coaching calls, there's this concept. I think there's a belief that social media is about being everywhere and posting content everywhere. And so what people do, I think, is they kind of get one piece of content and they just post it in five different places and then they sort of set and forget. Right. Yeah. And what I'm learning is that that's almost kind of more harmful than being on one platform and actively engaging in a way that provides value. What, what's your experience been? And I know you've, you're a bit more advanced and you, you do have a, a system for right. posting stuff everywhere. But, but what, what advice do you have in those early stages of, of getting started? Yeah, I agree. I mean, like you... Number one, if like, if your content isn't converting, like there's no point scaling it, right? 
like if if you have garbage in you have garbage out all over the place in a lot of places right but that's the thing it's like learning how yeah like you you need to learn first of all how social media works i think once you learn that on one platform when you start to branch out your approach will be a little bit more nuanced and, and mature and you'll probably be able to like manage that um but you're right like like especially on linkedin so linkedin is a networking platform so if you solely just go there and even if you just post content there, like you're not gonna get the insane organic reach that you might get on TikTok, where like you could post a video and get a million views. I, I suppose that potentially could happen on LinkedIn, but the normal story is more, it's like, a, it's like you can network at scale there. So if you imagine yourself at a networking group, that's how you should behave. And when you yeah. post content, that's like you giving a five minute presentation at the networking group. So, you, you know, it's a very short little thing and you're not asking for them to book calls with you and all these different things. So, and commenting is just like walking around the room and listening to what somebody says and providing your own unique thought on it, not giving them like, a, you know, your website address to go book a call. So, so yeah, I agree. Like you want to learn how to use these platforms. You, you, you want to pick one um, and just get really good at it. And once you're able to, to like, you really feel like you've got that mastered and it's working, then, then you could think about like, how do I go somewhere else? But the other thing to think about is like, there's more than enough, more than enough clients on LinkedIn for you. Yeah. There's more than enough clients on TikTok or on any of these platforms. So it's like, it's a little bit odd to think that you need to be on them all. One thing I have found now that I have kind of spread out is that the way I look at it is I have growth platforms where I spend most of my time trying to grow, but I am on the other platforms to kind of network because I do notice that people will find you on one platform, but they might have a preferred one and they might then go out and reach out on their preferred one, like LinkedIn, or they might go to that's Instagram. Right. Or, so I have networking platforms versus my growth platforms. And that's how I think about it. But I only did that after trying to expand too fast and really diluting my ability. So I agree. Yeah. It, I think you gotta be careful not to chase too many rabbits at the one time. The other thing that I've discovered in the short time, I've been very actively, you know, making a, a much more active move on, on LinkedIn is how that networking conversation begins to feed ideas for content. So one example right, was right. I was talking to a filmmaker who, um, is is in the transition phase there they're not really as focused on the corporate business they want to make films and i and i got in this interesting conversation there's a, there's a lot of um interesting topics being discussed in this brief brief conversation i was reading between the lines so i, I made a post about you know are you an artist or are you a, a, a commercial filmmaker are you someone who is um really focused on the arts or are you focused on the business and where does that balance create friction for you? Because there's a, a, a kind of an unspoken uh, community um, perspective, which says, you know, you should be a starving artist because if you're a starving artist or you're in pain, you'll create better art. And therefore by, you know, and conversely to that, if you are, making money from something that is deemed an artistic endeavor are you somehow selling out and and it stems deeper into a, a a question of people feeling good enough and especially creatives who have a who have a sensitive and fragile em emotional state which enhances the storytelling aspect but it was really interesting just posting that yeah. slightly provocative piece right about as art or commerce had tons of engagement and lots, lots of interest. And that then engaged someone who was interested to like it. I then reached out to them, discovered they have this platform and now they're having a podcast conversation. So in the space of three days, one direct outreach conversation led to an article, led to another connection, led to a podcast and then being exposed to a new network. Right. And that's, that's one person. So it's yeah. very powerful. Yeah. And you know what I think is interesting about that story? is that it goes back to one of your questions is like, how do you develop a system to come up with ideas and all this stuff? So there are ways of doing that. I have a bunch really. And one of them will work for you. One of them might not. 
but like nothing really replaces just being thoughtful yeah like there's no like system for being just like in the moment and being thoughtful like what you're you're telling a cool story and it's probably the most effective content it's really just being drawn from like something that happened and just like just going with it not putting it on a list in notion and coming back to it three days later when when the emotion is dead it's like you something happened you went with it it's emotional it, that's inevitably going to resonate with people it's going to be a better post like yeah so like for me for instance like i don't really have like at this point i i mean i've experimented with so many and i you need idea you need ways of generating ideas and keeping track of them and recording them but for the most part i'm just in the moment and just creating things and recording things and pulling things where there's an emotional charge to it that's actually going to be the stuff that people res respond to they can connect with um so i mean i think that's a great a great example because you got to be thoughtful and like if you're posting on every platform and you're just trying to get to the next one if you're just trying to create a system where it's just like and I'm an engineer and I'm telling maybe, maybe not to do this. You know, it's just like, you're going to miss out on being thoughtful and just slowing down and just, yeah. I remember Gary V said, uh, I think his, his exact words were just fucking care. Yeah. Yeah. Just care. Just like actually care about the people you're talking to. And, um, I think there's, there's something else that happens and, and you know, I'm, I, I think probably regard myself as pretty confident on camera nowadays. I've spoken on stages, but, but I, I wasn't always like that. I mean, four right. or five years ago, I was very, I was less comfortable, but I, I did it every day on, um, I think it was uh, Snapchat. I just started posting every day on Snapchat and I started getting used to talking to the camera because talking to an audience, you get feedback, talking to a camera, it's this inanimate object. Right. And, um, but I still, I still have to, I still second guess myself when I pick the camera up. Yeah. And I and I think that's actually something I recognize now as a strength. The vulnerability I feel. I, I woke up yesterday morning really early, went down to the beach at 5 a.m., went for a walk, and I bumped into a friend of mine on the beach, and she went, oh, I just woke up this morning in a bit of a funk. And I'm like, and, and I said, yeah, I feel a bit flat today. And so we had a bit of a chat about feeling flat, and I said, well, you know, go and enjoy the beach, and I'm going to go for a walk, and we parted ways. And then I went for a, an extended walk, and I... I did something, I can't remember where I heard it, but I heard some advice somewhere that said, you should just take a walk some days with no destination in mind. And so I kind of did that. I walked around where we live, we went around the beach, around the estate. That's awesome. And then I walked across a park and I thought, you know what? I woke up, I'm feeling a bit flat today and I've walked for an hour and I feel better. There's probably, there's probably content in this. So why don't I just record a video? And you know what? I said to myself, the little voice in my head was, I can record it and I can watch it back. And if it's no good, I won't post it. But I did. I actually recorded a quick video and said, do you ever wake up some days and just feel flat? What I do is I go for a walk and it worked for Steve Jobs. And when you walk, you move and you, you feel better. What, how, do you, how do you get out of a funk? And I posted that with a half a dozen words, just basically saying, hey, how do you get out of a funk? And tons of engagement because it's relatable. And I think right, yeah. we, we often feel like in a world of celebrity and people with huge followings that, you know, what, what possible voice can, can I have that's going to add any value? But I think what I've discovered, Stephen, is that by being vulnerable and sharing that we are human, yeah. often engages a deeper connection. Yeah, I think so too. And um, th that goes for like what you're going through right now. And also, also like, uh, like it's like, I guess it's imposter syndrome, not feeling like what you have is valuable. And, um, and so when I'm talking to people a lot of time around this, I'm also talking, because a lot of times people it's like, Hey, I haven't done that yet. Um, uh, so how can I make content around it? And, uh, I've made a living off of doing that. I'm always just talking about what I want to do, what I'm passionate about. I don't lie about anything, but I do have certain convictions on that. If I do this, this is going to happen. And so instead of me getting stuck or, or the advice to somebody else is instead of getting stuck because you haven't done something or 
uh, it's just like just make a make a prediction instead of saying something's true when it's not make a prediction and be that's what innovation really is like Steve Jobs just did a bunch of things that had never been done before and so I think that's like what you're talking about just being vulnerable talking about what you're going through being just being passionate about something looking into the future predicting something saying what you're gonna do those are all valid choices for content and in fact it's probably going to be a little bit more interesting than if you're just always looking to the past and saying what did i do last week okay i i installed a new light let me let me talk about the new light i installed yeah as opposed to being like hey i was in a funk i got this is how i got out of it this is what i see as the future let me talk about that those are i think those are almost more interesting than just all this how to information that people are always trying to go into the past and try to talk about. Yeah. And I think, I think what, what, what we all do initially with content is we think, well, I've got all these skills, I've got all this experience. So if I just share that experience, people will want to work with me. And what I've discovered is the opposite is true is that whether it's a question of overwhelm or disinterest or just, the, the the majority of contributors to these platforms just going, hey, look at me. And I think it's back to that selfish content. It's like, you actually don't need to have, I've discovered that many themes or pillars of content. Right, right, yeah. You can have three or four pillars of content that you talk about again and again. And and one of our colleagues in the, in the, um, in the mastermind we were at, Aaron was talking about, he basically has one theme that he talks about every single day. He right. just takes a different angle. And I guess my question to you is, do you have pillars that you use for content and certain topics that you just revisit with different flavors? Yeah, essentially. I mean, I talk about how to make good content and how to scale it. <laughs> that's like, and, and I say that, and I think that's an important point because like, I think a lot of times people go out and they're like, they're gonna build their brand, their personal brand. And it's just like really generic. They're talking about everything that they know. And like, I don't think that works really well unless you're like Alex Hermosi or Gary Vee, where you've built like a hundred million dollar company. And like anything you say is basically like, oh my God, like he said that. Because like, even though I've sold a company, like it wasn't a hundred million dollar company. So people might trust me a little bit more because I've sold a company, I have business experience. It's not like I'm not in a league of my own. So the way you're going to cut through the noise is by talking about the same things over and over again. And then using that as a way to be like, to push your own boundary in that topic. Right? So if I just keep talking about good content, then I have to keep investing in making good content. If I keep talking about how to scale it, I have to keep going deeper on how to do that in a more, more and more nuanced way. I have to come up with a new diagram, a new framework to push my own boundary. So having that, those limited pillars not only will make your content better but it will literally force you to push through like push through right so like i always just encourage people don't look at the content as just a way to get more business it's a way to develop new products and to push your own boundaries and if you look at it more holistically it's going to be way more interesting and valuable to you than if you if you're like how do i get a client because then you're going to do it for all the wrong reasons all the yeah. content's going to have, it, it's going to have the wrong intention behind it. And therefore people will sense it and it won't work. And that is so interesting that, that, that idea of intention. So I've noticed in, in email marketing, for example, when I put together pre-written campaigns that go out on a kind of, on a basis of, of, of a particular campaign, they don't get the same kind of, engagement and response than if I do a broadcast post that's like today. And I've never been able to quite understand this because there should be no difference because it's delivered in the same way. <laughs> but I, I, I actually truly believe that it's the energy behind it and the intention that carries some kind of invisible force out yeah. to the market. And I think I the think same so. is true with content. When you um, produce content that is fresh and raw and of the moment i often find that has a very strong response because of the energy behind it i agree and i think it's i think people are also just developing a sensitivity to 
the tactics that have been used for the last 10 years and you can just kind of smell it, I think. Yeah. Uh, even if it's, you're not totally aware of it and, uh, people can, um, people are just getting good at sensing that through the, the ones and the zeros that come through the, the internet. Well, we've, we're out of time today, but I'd, I'd love to get you back on to talk more about the, the practicalities of how to right. distribute content. Because what we're talking about here is yeah, picking up your phone, making a post and putting it on a platform. But to do this at scale, you need, you need more structure. You need a system. So uh, I'd love to get you back to talk about that um, maybe next week. Let's do it.